Okay, so we're going to be entering live now. Should be able to take a second to do it. But how's your morning looking? It must be quite early where you are right now, I think. It's 7.30 and it is windy, but it's light out. So I can't get right <laughs> here, get in an early, early, get an early start. Yeah, you're joining the EMEA crew. Obviously, Ali's in the States right now. So um, welcome, everybody, to episode two of the Keys to AWS Optimization, the show where we share stories, concepts, solutions to help you unlock the cost at your AWS account and help you kind of learn. So ask and you shall receive. Last week, we spoke a lot about the well-architected labs. And so we have brought on the guru herself, Ali, to join us and talk about the well-architected labs. Uh, we're going to be chatting about the future of them, asking some questions, but please, if you have questions, then tell us like what your thoughts on the labs are. Have you used any of the labs? Drop them in the comments. Uh, so let's let's kick off, Ali. What brought you to the world of optimization? Well, I actually started my career at Accenture, and I was a technology consultant there. And I got to work with a many different variety of global customers, and I was able to see the ins and outs of how they were handling these cloud transitions. And kind of how I got into optimization then was I uh, was brought onto a project at a global media and entertainment customer who was really in a phase of extreme cloud growth. They were going through an acquisition as well too. And I, you know, having a background in finance as well as the understanding of the IT area, got brought in to kind of help with optimization there and really understand their cloud costs. Mm -hmm. uh, from day one, I was hooked. I was, <laughs> you know, just digging into the data. I am completely a data nerd. And you know, from there, I started to really dig into the ins and outs of it and work closely with AWS. I actually got to work with my now manager, Alex, who's the other co-host of the show, and really just enjoy digging into you know, how can we better enable our teams? How can we give them the tools that they need for success? And I want to do this full time. And so I joined AWS and still get to work with my own team, but also get to you know, work with many other customers and also help enable customers I don't actually get to directly work with through the labs. Awesome, awesome. And so everybody, please feel free to ask Ali questions. She is so knowledgeable about this stuff. Chuck it in the chat. And if you have any uh, saving shout outs, we mentioned this last week, any call outs you want to do that you've done really well, feel free to drop those in. So loving data, getting into it. How did you come across the well-architected labs? So I actually stumbled across them when I was a customer myself. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, we were going through an acquisition, and so I was trying to get more data. I really needed to understand how I could see and get more visibility. And I was using the good old Excel at the time. And <laughs> it was crashing on me all the time. I was just spinning my wheels, and I stumbled upon the well-architected labs. And the first one I did was the actually level 200 pricing model analysis which was how to get started with my cost and usage report, which you'll hear me talk a lot about because it is probably my favorite report because it has so much data in it. But I was able to get started with my cost and usage report and completely change how much time it took me to do things and what I was able to give my teams. And from there, I was hooked. I think I spent, spent a week literally just going through every lab, going to my team saying, hey, I need these permissions. Hey, I need a dummy account to do this. I really want to get more data here. I want to make it as real as possible. And mm -hmm. It was from there that I discovered who created the labs, Nathan Besh, and I went in on YouTube and watched all of his old reInvent videos, <laughs> made sure that I was kind of just engrossed in that world. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Nathan. He connected me and Ali back in the day before I started working at Amazon. And he actually was like, why wasn't I mentioned in your first episode? So shout out to Nathan, hero of, uh, of the cost pillar at Amazon. Um, so yeah, just so good, so good. So you got into the labs, and and what what was your role title at the, that time when you first started looking at the labs? Did you say I was a cloud uh, cost optimization program lead. Cool. So do you think that's the the normal target audience? Are there it can, can it go to anybody? What kind of levels are we looking at when we talk about the labs? I think it really goes to anybody. I think the level one hundred is really you know if you're non technical, that's where you'd want to start because it's the really foundation where, you know, you don't need a background, you don't need a, you know, a good understanding of AWS, you're really getting the foundations there. 
and mm -hmm. then you know you can you can build on it so each of the labs build on each other so the 100 doesn't have that coding or cli or sdk experience that you need but it introduces a concept and then kind of walks you through why should i care about it so for right. example not just saying cost explorer is free to see your cost but how do you actually use cost explorer and then they mm -hmm. kind of build out on top of it so i'd say it's for any audience but depending on the level of where you're at and and what you're looking to do you might want to do a 100 a 200 or a 300 but regardless of what you do you can kind of connect the dots for your teams through it great and so the, those of you who might just joined us for this so we're just talking about the well architected labs um if you've used them what's what's your favorite lab uh one of my favorites is uh the cost intelligence dashboard which i believe ali made um do you want to tell them a bit about that dashboard yeah, so the cost intelligence dashboard is something that I wished I would have had when I was a customer. And mm -hmm. it's something that, you know, one of the areas that I mentioned was that cost and usage report, which again, you'll hear me mention a lot of times, is uh, within that cost and usage report, you know, how do you really get started? When I was a customer, my cost and usage report was about, uh, you know, I think 300 columns wide a huge, mm -hmm. massive report, and I didn't know where to get started. And I think a lot of other folks are in that similar situation. And I think, Steph, you were in it too, as, as well as a customer. Definitely, definitely. And so how could we kind of bridge that bridge, bridge that gap and get them started? And yeah. so that's where the kind of cost intelligence dashboard was born out of. It actually started with working with one customer and cool. got me thinking, how could we do this with more customers? How could we create a way that they could gain additional insights into the reports, but also customize it and make it into something their, uh, their own. Because the whole point of the labs is to teach you to fish for yourself, teach you to really mm -hmm. be able to take something and run with it and translate it into how it means for your business. And so the cost intelligence dashboard allows you to take the cost and usage report and get whatever level of granularity you need in terms of the way your business is run and let your mm -hmm. team see the true cost of running their applications. Cool. Are there any specific visuals that you think are really useful that people seem to love in the dashboard? I'd say the reserved instance and savings plans visuals. Nice. The reason that one is, is because you get a single pane of glass. And that's always one of the biggest asks is, you know, I know I have reserved instances. I know I have savings plans, but I want to see holistically. What does it mean for me? And how can I show the value it's adding to my teams? Definitely. I mean, RAs and savings plans are like one of the top topics, I think. We're, and if anybody uh, wants us to talk about that as one of our episodes, we could bring in some people that are <laughs> much better at them than I am. We have another team that does that a lot. Um, but yeah, super. I bet that's really, really useful. And how was it um, creating the lab? Because I've, um, we'll probably talk, talk a bit about one of the ones I've made, but this was a big a big lab that involved like a lot of people it involved the QuickSight team it involved we've mentioned Nathan who managed the labs what was it like for you kind of going through that process I'm interested to know <laughs> <laughs> I will say it was definitely a, a long process in the sense that I think Nathan has created an amazing foundation for us to be able to use the labs in the true form of open source so anyone can mm -hmm. contribute to them but with that yeah. he's put some really good guardrails in place that really challenge you to think is this lab usable for everyone? And so I think I went through my steps countless times. And mm -hmm. I think I even <laughs> had my parents going through them to make sure they understood it. Because what you really need to do is, you know, you need to take the human side out of it. They're only yeah. seeing a screen, making sure that they can walk through anyone, walk through and be able to complete each step of it and not get stuck. And so really taking a step back and going back to the basics. And so I think mm -hmm. that was probably one of the you know, most difficult parts was just, you know, putting it in a very, very simple, succinct step-by-step -step process. Mm -hmm. And then probably the thing that took the longest was the video and <laughs> getting the video. I have discovered that I am, you know, I don't think I want to be in the video industry of making videos because <laughs> she says while well, being on a video, <laughs> hey, this one's live. So it's a little bit better. The other one was, you know, recorded. And I think I did 50 takes and Alex, I did it in her garage actually with her. And half of them were me just laughing because I would forget what I was saying or get perfect and then mess <laughs> up on the last line. <laughs> you can see all the effort. And if you haven't seen the video, like 
what's a video? It's really not because it's funny, but because it is really useful. I recommend the dashboard to all of my customers. And whenever I bring it up, I have to go and watch the video and be like, just make sure I share everything. But rather than me explain it again, I always point them to that because that is a great kind of overview of what the dashboard is all about and what all the metrics means. And it's it's good. So I think it's a good video, Ali. It, it, don't worry about it. You do smile a lot in, the, in it, which I enjoy. And if I now know it's because you had to restart, it makes it even better for me. Oh, yes. And you'll notice there's like little clips where we had to clip it in and out. And so you'll see my head <laughs> slightly shift. But it was definitely worth it. I mean, I will say it was probably one of the best experiences I've had since being here cool. because I was able to go from, you know, working with the customers I work with, which is a subset of our media, entertainment and high tech global customers to yeah. being able to connect with customers of every industry in all sizes. Mm -hmm. And so it was awesome to be able to expand that reach but also get to know what what you know what their thoughts were on cost optimization and cost visibility and how we could help enable them better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Are there any standout kind of customer stories, the people that you know have used the dashboard that you're like, you're really proud that they got to use it? Um, well, I would say, and I, I won't say their name, but uh, <laughs> another, there's there's a two, two customers that I've seen that have really done some cool things with it. And yeah. uh, well, two, two examples I want to share. One is an, another global media entertainment customer who, when I they showed me what they had done to the dashboard, I just took a step back and was like, wow, you guys have really taken this and created something, you know, completely exceptional. They actually mm -hmm. have granularity down to the you know, different leveling of time granularity, different level of their teams. They have multi-payer in it. They're really nice. doing some amazing things that, you know, they actually took it and were able to separate out with the security levels to give each of their teams different accesses mm -hmm. and use it also to, you know, influence their decisions on what they're purchasing because they bring an optimization to. Another customer that I think is a really cool story on this is a customer who was just getting started and was trying to show their teams, you know, their leadership, why they should, you know, start pushing their teams to organize and have better governance. And they said that they actually put this dashboard up to the leadership and was like, you know, we can't tell where our cost is going. You know, <laughs> I have all this data, but but who's actually spending it? Yeah. And they're like, well, this account goes to this person. And, and they're like, okay, so, but within that account, there's three different teams. How do we know right. what the business value of it is? How do we know that we are, you know, making the most efficient decisions? And how do we know mm -hmm. that, you know, these teams know what they're actually spending? And that actually allowed them to go back and take a step back to do a tagging strategy, take a step back to rethink about their provisioning process. And they are now one of probably the most organized customers I've ever seen. <laughs> That's so great. The it just shows that um, even if you're not sure with the dashboard. So if you if you deploy, if you're not sure if you're watching today and you're like, oh, I don't know if I, if I need it, if it has everything I want, deploy it because it gets all that data centralized into one place so you can see it. But because it's customizable and like Ali said, you can do whatever you want with it. It will give you first of all that kind of visibility of what's going on. But then secondly, you have the ability to play around if the dashboard, if you want to add some bits, if you want to change the way it looks, if you want to add tags, if you want to make it just so that you see it, that you see everybody's. It has so many possibilities, but it is a great, a great starting point. So uh, we have a question. Uh, I'm going to check it up on the screen. So uh, were the cost dashboards cross account? I'm assuming that these are CloudWatch dashboards with cost metrics. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> yeah, so the well-architected cost intelligence da dashboard uses the cost and usage report, which is the most granular cost level reporting that AWS has. And, um, you know, it doesn't pull in CloudWatch metrics today, but you can definitely overlay that in there. And so it uses the cost and usage report. There are member cost and usage reports, so you can have them on an individual linked account. But typically the people that we see using it most are within their payer or um their payer account or the you know owner of the members. And what they're actually able to do there is see all of the member accounts across the organization in a single pane of glass. And so if you're using it at that payer account level, you'll see all your accounts. If you're at the member account, you'll see just your member account there. Great, yeah. So hopefully that has answered the question. It's, it, it, I just can't rave about the, the dashboard enough. <laughs> but let's, let's talk about the rest of the Well Architects Labs because there are so many other bits. You mentioned one of your favorites being the account one. Have you got, this is a plug, have you got any other favorites that uh, that you like? Well, there's, 
the one I'm the, wearing at the moment? <laughs> well, there there might be one, and and I I actually will say two. And the reason for it is is um, well, for sure the Kerr Query Library, which is one that I think is a little bit different shape of how the labs are today. Uh, most of the labs are, you know, you kind of go through it. The Kerr Query Library is meant to be something that you want to bookmark all the time. The Kerr Query Library is really how can you continue to dig into your data of your cost and usage report? How can you take it to a deeper level of understanding and, and make sure that you're really making the most of what you have at your fingertips? And so that one's always evolving. And then, of course, I love your lab on uh, the organizational <laughs> data and bringing that in because anything that you can do to overlay the cost and usage report to gain more intelligence is, I think, simply amazing. And so that gives you a way to actually um, bring in your organizational units, their tags within it, and kind of all that information and overlay it with the cost and usage report. So now you've taken something that has an account ID and made it something tangible to your business. So I think, you know, using them in conjunction is really something that's really cool. And those three different labs right there really show you how you can use them together to gain additional insight. Yeah, it's, and, and not to promote our lab. So I literally got this today. I got this swag that you guys can see, which is my Kerr Library hoodie and well-architected mug, if you can see that in the light. So, um, to re-emphasize Ali's points, like the Kerr Library is, is a team effort. There are other people hopefully who will be going to watch this that we've all come together. Ali has been also very crucial with that because she's been our moderator. She's checked all of our queries are actually logical and not just nonsense that we've put down. Uh, but it's a great, great resource. And you can, again, it's a customizable thing. So if you have, we've put up queries that are useful, but you can tweak them. You can make them work for your accounts. You can add in more data. You can filter by things. It's just a great way to get started. And if you contribute to them, you get swag like I am wearing and drinking from today. So always a good plug. If you have a query out there, I know when I was a customer, I used to have tons of queries, my own kind of library, and just share them, like help other people. Um, I'm just going to have a look. We've got a couple of questions coming in. So someone's talking about trusted advisors. So just to swap out. So is that how trusted advisor works as well? I'm assuming about the rolling up. Uh, is everything rolled up into one payer? Um, so you can look at Trusted Advisor, I believe, in singular accounts. Is there a, mm -hmm. and you can collect it into, so it's all deployed into individual accounts that you can look at that data, but you can connect and collect it all. There is an AWS Solutions, uh, which I can bring up that does that. But any tips yeah. on well architected information, Ali? Yeah, so they're actually within the Trusted Advisor. There's Trusted Advisor organizational reporting. And um, now, and so within the payer account, you can see a consolidated view as well. Something really cool about this is it's the consolidated view of what your teams are seeing. And so yes. you can actually have your teams using them in their own accounts, but then aggregate it up. And I am trying to find, uh, and I'll paste it in as well. There's actually a trusted advisor organizational view workshop that'll help you get a dashboard set up. Oh, and amazing. it's part of the overall kudos framework. So let me... Yeah, share that. Awesome. I, think I saw another question. Uh, let's show this one. So one thing I struggled with was multi-tenant was how to break down cost per service. For example, EMR could be a thousand dollars per month, but it is some of our tenants that drive those costs. So this is more about I think looking at cost allocation and splitting things down. Um, any advice on that? Yeah, so I think the first would be is, and and while I'm answering this, uh, Steph, I don't think it was letting me paste it into the chat, so I posted oh, it in the private chat. If you can add that link over, because it's a really great framework. And so I'd yes. love for people to be able to yeah. see it. But on the you know, multi-tenant and how to break it down on a cost per service per tenant, that's actually something that we're looking at um, a future lab for. And so Brilliant. there's some different tools that you can use to do that. I'd say the hardest part about it is, you know, what level of granularity do you want to see your cost and and really defining you know how do you need to see it and how is it structured because i think you know the word tenant gets thrown out there a lot and you know i've heard it be having different meetings across different customers and so really making sure you know what is exactly are you trying to break it down are you trying to break down something like um you know your container usage and break it down within it because you have different teams using uh, the same cluster or what exactly are you trying to break down and see 
and really mm-hmm. back it out into what level of granularity do you want to see and how what do you have already and then build on it. So it might be tags, it might be, you know, adding additional insights in using CloudWatch data, using container insights. There's a lot of different ways you can bring in additional insights there. Right. And if um if uh, if you want to get in contact and ask any other difficult questions about specific cost optimization, feel free to tweet me at lift like a nerd. Uh, I, I promise at some point I'll cover why that's my handle, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for today maybe not. So uh, yeah, feel free to to reach out if you want to chat more about that. It'd be an interesting thing to dive into. So let's let's think about. So we've covered uh, the cost intelligence dashboard, the Kerr library, all these amazing labs that exist out there. What's the future? What what's coming up next? Yeah, so I think um, you know what what we've done since um, we've started taking on the labs, and I say we because as much as Steph will say I am <laughs> leading kind of the well-architected cost labs, I would say that she has been my partner in crime through this all. She has <laughs> been there helping with every step of the way, so I'd say almost she's the co-lead with it on me there. And um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is you know just first how can we bring it all back together, you know, make it a little bit easier to see how each of the labs connect, but then also automation, because I think something that I get told a lot is you know we don't use CloudFormation and we actually need Terraform. Is there a way that we can use Terraform? you know, for this lab. Or, you know, I really like the manual steps, but I want to implement this at my organization. We need automation in place. Do you have, um, you know, Terraform or CloudFormation versions of the lab? And today we have those on some of them, but not on nearly enough of them. And so that's one of the key focus areas there is really trying to, you know, leverage automation. So giving those options to different customers. And I know, Steph, you've been pivotal and, you know, helping do a lot of that there. But, you know, it's, it's coming with time. And then a couple kind of other areas is new topics. I think one thing you'll notice within the labs is something glaring is where's tags? There's not very much information on tagging. And so Mm -hmm. we're working on a tagging lab. One of our amazing team members is actually in the process of working on that right now. And Mm -hmm. also some kind of higher level um, information on how you can use other methods, including tagging as well as other pieces to actually go deeper into understanding your applications and bringing in other data sources as well too. So a lot on how do you gain that next level of visibility. Great. I mean, yeah, Ali has mentioned I, I'm helping do this. <laughs> I'm biased to talking about it. But I was the same when I was a customer, I think it was, is it the pricing, the pricing one where you can compare savings plans? Uh, it gives you a great visual of what you're using at the moment and what savings plans to buy. And it's really useful when you collect uh, data from the EC2 pricing data that you can just download. And I thought it was a great lab. Nathan got me to do it. And I was like, this is really useful. But now I need to turn it into code because I can't have manual things deployed in my account just because it's not feasible for the way that we manage things. So the drive for that is is definitely going to be automation, Terraform, CloudFormation, both. uh, I shouted out Terraform a lot last week. So shouting out again, we'll be bringing that in. Um, But if there's any labs out there that you think that you have some code that you'd like to to talk to us about, then please let us know uh, that you can find the GitHub and contribute. Um, And uh, as I said, the tagging one coming up, I think is going to be really useful. And we're also, uh, Optics is doing a blog post about tagging soon. So hopefully those two things will be coming out and we'll bring those up on a follow up episode about tagging later on. Uh, so we've got some more uh, questions. Here we go. Any lab to work out cost saving for databases? Good question. Any plans on that or any tips? I think we might need to look into having one now. So, um, you know, if you have any ideas of what you'd like to see, uh, you know, feel free to post them in the chat because we'd love to dig into them. Or if you want to contribute as well, there's a guide to contributing on the labs. So feel free, they're open source. We want to make sure they're as collaborative as possible. But I think we definitely will be needing to have something more on databases. Uh, in the meantime, if you do if you do use that trusted advisor um, organization dashboard, and, and that's that workshop I sent, there is some information on your RDS idle database instances because it does have that within your trusted advisor report. So that's one way you can get started today. But I think we definitely need to bring something in on um, RDS and, and databases in general within mm-hmm well architected labs that's a great point uh thank you for that comment because uh we hadn't considered that i don't think and that's the link just at the bottom for the trusted advisor workshop so have a look uh for there for the rds stuff 
There um, is also cool. one other thing to bring it back to it, actually. There is, if you want to dig into your queries, you can use the Kerr Query Library with the databases there. There's a section on databases. And so while it doesn't exactly kind of walk you through cost savings for databases, you can get that visibility you need to now take it to the next level to see, you know, how can I maybe get from information to understand where my spend trends are. Yeah, that's a great point. The I think we're hoping to add some more cost optimization queries to the library. There's one in there for GP2 to GP3, I think. But if anybody, again, if anybody out there has any queries that they know is really good to highlight savings, then contribute, get the swag. That's, that's the goal. Uh, so we have another question, slightly different. Can you speak about the difference of Curve versus Cost Explorer API at a high level? Do you want to tackle that, Ali, or do you want me to take it? Yeah, I can take it. So the cost and usage report, um, it has, you know, a lot of more, a lot more additional fields, I'd say in terms of what's available there, it is a lot more granular in terms of, um, you know, what's available. It's, it's also kind of a canned report that, that is dropped into your S3 bucket and you typically use Athena to analyze it or, you know, another source to analyze it there. Whereas the cost explorer API is really kind of how do you automate those cost explorer type views that you're using. And so um, we typically see folks using the Cost Explorer API for uh, some of those more repeatable processes that they use and, mm -hmm. and you know, that they want to have a exact a mirrored view of what their teams are using in Cost Explorer today. Uh, typically, though, what I do see most folks using is the Cur in terms of, you know, creating the more rep replicable processes because mm -hmm. the Cur and Cost Explorer actually feed from the same database. And so at the foundation, the root of it, they all lead back to the same data. And so you really can use them in parallel. It's just, you know, where are you trying to analyze the data and what story are you trying to tell? Yeah, there's a, there was just a blog release and I'm trying to find it, which is about uh, how you can pull out cost, uh, cost explorer data and connect it to, the, uh, to your organization data. Um, I'll try and find it by the end of the video. Otherwise I'll bring it up next week. Uh, we also have another question. Do we have a lab showing the full potential of S3 intelligent tiering? With the growth of the data in business intelligent areas, I fear the cost was something to look at in the short time. That's a great question there. Uh, S3 intelligent tiering. Do we have anything? I, There's a lot of cost questions, actually. I wonder if, sorry to cut you off, Ali, go on. No, no, definitely. I was, I was just going to say, I think this is another area. And actually, I was working with my teammate, John, on this yesterday. He had done kind of a how to guide of intelligent tiering. And then mm -hmm. I had taken a life cycle um, policy approach to it as well too, to show the two different options. I think this is something that we would want to bring in as well. I actually, you know, one of the things with intelligent tiering is, you know, I think a lot of times folks don't know, you know, how to get started with it. I think, you know, sometimes you don't want to, you don't want to, risk having increased costs with it if it wasn't a great use case for it. And so definitely could see a lab on how do you kind of identify some target workloads that you might want to enable this on and also mm -hmm. kind of show you, you know, what it looks like over time. Because for the first 30 days, you kind of sit there going, oh, my goodness, I, I'm, yeah. did, did, I'm, did I do something wrong? I, I'm not seeing any <laughs> impact. And then all of a sudden, after that first 30 days, we typically see this just whoosh where your costs yep. just completely drop down. But I also want to call out that, you know, with an intelligent tiering, there's, with an S3, there's also a life cycle policies. And mm -hmm. so if you haven't taken a look at, say, like S3 storage lens, you can also see your multi-part uploads there and, and things such as that, where you can have just some simple life cycle policies to clean up your um, multi-part uploads. You can clean up your versions and you can also transition data. Um, nice. And so, you know, take a look at both of them because there might be just some simple use cases that you can use uh, lifecycle policies for. Awesome. And uh, in, I don't know if you said this, in the cost intelligence dashboard, there's views of storage as well, isn't there? Yes, there is views of storage in there too. And you can see uh, actually within the cost and usage report, your resource ID, which is the lowest level of granularity within the report, will actually show you your buckets. And so you can actually see your unique buckets and understand kind of, um, you know, what the cost and usage is there, how it's spread across the different storage tiers too. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, one more question and then we will finish up. So is there a reliable way to monitor network charges without cost allocation tags? Interested in gaining more understanding of uh, internal, uh, uh, 
in and out charges and where they stem from? Yeah. So I think, you know, tagging all, you know, tagging also always does give you that additional area of granularity, but there's other sources you can use. Um, you know, depending on how your accounts are structured, you might be as simple as being able to use your account structure if you're using one account per one account. Um, but if not, you know, there's a lot of other data points you can be pulling in. Uh, so I would highly recommend looking into, you know, some of your other um, metrics that you have available and, and starting to aggregate that data across it. So bringing in all of your cloud watch logs, bringing in all of your other analytics and creating kind of an analytics account for your organization. So uh, dumping everything that you might think you need to analyze into a separate account that you can use to dive deeper into that. And that's a great point, having somewhere that all the data goes. I'm always a recommended that you put everything into some kind of format in JSON in, in S3 and then run Athena over it and then you can join everything together. And that's that's always what I recommend. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're at time, guys. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Ali, for coming on and chatting with us today. Uh, I hope you guys have learned some things. I really recommend checking out the the cost well into uh, well well architected labs especially the cost <laughs> pillar but also to shout out the other pillars on there are really useful as well so feel free to check those out and there are ways to contribute on there and give us feedback next week we will me and alex will be talking about unit costs focusing i think on ec2 unit costs so think about any questions you have for that and uh, we'll see you next week bye everyone see you everyone thanks steph